Yeah, so this video, just let me tell you what it basically does. I go through all of the more important sections of the VAT Act. The ones that are truly difficult, I will do in their own individual sections. Things like change in use, apportionment of VAT, okay, leasehold improvements, going concern, cessation of business. Those types of sections I will do in their own videos, but I'm going to go through all of the VAT implications with you now. So let's just start. So first VAT diagram. I've got here, VAT is levied on the supply of goods or services by a vendor carrying on an enterprise. Okay. And people look at me and say, sure, do I need to know this? And you know something, it's probably one of the more important ones for you to know, because let me just explain something to you. Imagine you got given a, a, a practical situation whereby you got, got a tenancy within a shopping mall, Woolworths come in, Woolworths say, I'm not interested in having another uh, food producer next to me. Um, so what the shopping center does is it says, we're kicking you out, we're putting Woolworths in, and we're going to pay you 2 million rands worth of compensation. And then the question is asked, so is the compensation subject to that? Okay. Or not. And people are going to sit there and go, um, 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 you're not going to know whether the compensation is subject to VAT. So let's just go through how you might deal with this. So whenever you don't know how to deal with something, this is the default position that you always come back to. So whenever there's something you're not quite sure whether there's VAT or not, you come back and you sit there and say, VAT is levied on the supply of goods and services by a vendor carrying on an enterprise. And guys, we don't know whether it's a supplier. So what do we need to do? Okay, is compensation a supply? Yes or no? So what we need to do is we need to have actually tagged off our books properly. And here's the VAT legislation sheet. And guys, I've tagged off all of the sections and I'm gonna come back and show you. But guys, there it is. In section one, there's a definition of a supply. And you're going to go and see whether compensation paid is within the definition of a supply. And they do discuss about rights inside there. Okay. And the next thing is the supply of goods or services. Okay. Will there be a good? There's definitely not a good for compensation. But can it be a service? And you'll see the definition of right, a compensation right is included in the definition of a service. So we're going to say, have they supplied us or something? Yes. A service? Yes, because right is included in the definition of a service. And what are we going to be able to do? Okay. Buy a vendor? Yes, the shopping center is a vendor. Are they carrying on an enterprise? Well, rent is an enterprise. Therefore, we're going to charge VAT on the compensation. Okay? And that's the way that you're going to have to do that. So please just understand this. This is your default position. This is if you don't know what to do. Come back, have a look at the definition of a supply, have a look at the definition of goods or services, and make a decision based on that. And that's why this diagram is very, very important. Okay, just another thing, guys, just at the bottom here. All section 64 and 65 of the VAT Act state the prices displayed must include VAT unless the VAT exclusive price, the VAT, and the final consideration are separately shown. So in a shop, if you walk in and they've got something marked on the shelf, you may assume that something is including VAT by law. If it is not VAT inclusive, they need to say that the amount excludes VAT and this is how much VAT is going to be on it. So that's something very, very important from a practical perspective. So that's there. Please understand that. Okay, next diagram. How not to make mistakes in a VAT question. So I'm just going to give you a couple of pointers, guys. So these are the ones that are called the FUBAR ones, the ones that if you don't get them right, you fuck it up beyond all recognition. Terrible, terrible stuff up, okay? So guys, you need to look and see whether amounts include VAT or exclude VAT. If amounts include VAT, you need to do the amount times 15 over 115. 
If an amount excludes VAT, you need to do the amount times 15%. Often in exams, they say insurance cash payout is equal to a million rand. Guys, if it's a cash payout, it includes VAT. Please just make sure that you understand that if there's VAT on that particular item, but generally with insurance, there's going to be VAT on it. Okay, so that's principle one. If amounts include VAT times 15 over 115, if amounts exclude VAT times 15%. Second of all, guys, what is the VAT category? Could be monthly, that's a category C. Two monthly, that's A and B. Could be six monthly, that's a D. Or a 12 monthly, which is an E. Okay, guys, if you're answering an exam question, please just have a look to see what that category is. Because if they look at you and say, please do the April VAT return, okay, what's going to happen? If you're category C, it's just April. If it's a category A or B, well, it can't be an A because A's are Jan, March, May, all the odd months. So a B category for April would be March and April. Okay. If they ask you to do a fair VAT return for a category D, that would be a six-month return. And I have seen it happen once, but that was in the 1990s when I was helping out. But I have seen a category D in an exam before, and it would be a six-month. E, you won't get. That's just for holding companies with management fees and stuff like that. I don't think you'd ever get that. That's a 12-month return itself. Consideration three, guys. Are you registered on a, reg on a payments basis or an invoice basis? Just let me explain, guys. Companies and CCs have to be on an invoice basis. There's no choice in the matter. So if you get a company, it's always invoice basis. What's the rule for invoice basis? Earlier of payments or invoice, okay? If you're a natural person, you can be on a payments basis provided you below two and a half million rand. For a payments basis, guys, I'm gonna, I've got a diagram that I'm gonna do with you right now. So please just make sure you see whether you're on an invoice or a payments basis. And then guys, the other thing is just see what your book is. Is it a general ledger? Because general ledger are great for invoice questions. And cash books are great for payments. But if you get a cash book in an invoice question, please understand you need to adjust for accruals. And if you get a general ledger for a payments question, you need to adjust for payments. So it's always a good thing not to screw up a question, just to have a look at the book of entry that you're looking at, because general ledger should be used for invoice, cash books for payments. If you don't have all of that information, you're going to have to convert a, a little bit of this stuff. So just again, consideration one for not stuffing up something. Is it inclusive or exclusive? And times by 15 over 115 if it's inclusive. If it's exclusive, times by 15%. Get the VAT category right. If you're doing an April VAT return, it's important to know whether it's one month or two months. If it's a February VAT return, it could be one month, two months, or six months, or it could be a 12 month as well. Okay, so make sure you do that. Companies, invoice basis. Individuals, turnover less than two and a half million can be payment if they want to be, but they can also be invoice. Have a look to see it. Do I have a general ledger or a cash book and do I need to make adjustments to it? So that is diagram two. Diagram three, payments and invoice basis. So guys, essentially invoice basis, okay? This is really, really important because did you notice on the VAT example that I did with you before, I basically said general rule for invoice is the VAT is on the earlier of date of issue of the invoice or the date that the payment is received. So this is going to go into just about every single discussion question at least once, okay? So you need to be able to actually put that in, okay? Invoice basis, all companies, corporate entities have to use invoice. And natural persons where it's more than two and a half million. Payments basis can be used by other people. But just remember, over here, says when a transaction other than a property transaction exceeds 100,000 Rand, the invoice basis has to be used. So even if you're on the payments basis, if a transaction is for more than 100,000 Rand, you need to use the invoice basis, even if you registered on the payments basis itself. 
So guys, you can go through that. Here are your bat categories, as I've discussed already. You can have a look. Registration often pops up, okay? It's different now, okay? So I changed a couple of years ago. It's not if you are going to be over a million, it's when you get over a million. So let me just explain. First consideration, if you sign a contract, where in terms of that contract, you're gonna make supplies exceeding a million, then you have to register now. So you don't wait. Because I've got a contract and I know I'm gonna be over a million. If you don't have signed contracts, you don't have to register until the month that you get over a million. So if month one is 400, no reg. Month two, 400, no reg. Month three, 300, I now need to register because I'm gonna be over a million and I need to register for that. So it's only in the month that you do it, although voluntarily you can register earlier. Okay, so you can see voluntary registration you need. 50,000 or more in the last 12 months or likely to get 50,000, okay? Commercial accommodation, if you're running a and b or something along those lines, just please just remember that needs to be more than 120 if you're running like a and b or something like that. Commercial accommodation has to be at least 120 before they'll register you, not 50. Okay, so that's there. And then what do you need to remember? Abnormal transactions that are not likely to recur, you don't need to include in that 1 million amount. So I sell my house for 2 million. I know it's more than a million, but I don't need to register because it's an abnormal transaction that is unlikely to reoccur. Now, guys, often in practice and in exams, you see foreign suppliers. Now, guys, you don't need to learn foreign suppliers. You don't. Okay, so for every diagram, this shows you the sections that you can do so that you can find stuff. So as you can see here, I did payments and invoice basis. So next to section 9.1 of the VAT Act, I think you should put a tag that says time of supply general rule. And then what do you highlight inside your cycle legislation handbook? Okay, you should highlight this time and invoice is issued or payment of consideration, whichever time is earlier. So guys, if you put a tag there, you put the tag saying time of supply rule, and then you highlight that, it's very, very easy to remember the time of supply general rule. Section 10.3 has got the value of supply general rule. And guys, highlight, I'm someone that really likes if you've got 12 highlighters. So highlight the tag in yellow, highlight in the book in yellow, you know where the tag and the writing go together and if you're on the same page the next one you'll do in blue and the next one in green and then in purple and then if you really like that pastel set of highlighters you'll use all of your pastel colors so that you know which one it relates to so you'll see as we go through i've got everything there's the rules for registration for a contract there's your tags okay compulsory registration items removed from one million there's another thing there. Foreign supply registration. Guys, what's going to happen? It says in section 23.1a, overseas sellers have to register if turnover is more than a million. So like if you're Amazon doing, okay, something. It's more than a million. You need to register for VAT in South Africa. The other thing, guys, I just wanted to show you is for your registration itself. So I just want to just, there we go. Okay. Guys, this one, foreign internet sellers. That's another thing just to bear in mind. You do, don't need to learn it off by heart. But guys, if someone's selling overseas into South Africa on the internet, two out of the three things that is over here needs to be in place and then they have to register for that. So if they ever ask you, should Amazon register or you've got a foreign company that wants to register for that, do they need to register? Here it is. It's in section one, paragraph six of the definition of an enterprise and it shows you when they need to do it. So 
The three things are the recipient of those electronic services is a resident of the Republic. So whoever receives it is in South Africa. The payment, okay, originates from a bank in South Africa. And the recipient of those electronic services has a business address, residential address, or postal address in the Republic. So if two out of those three things apply, that foreign internet seller has to register in South Africa. Okay, so I've got all of the things there. You don't need to learn it off by heart. If you've tagged it in your book, you can go and find it and you'll be able to answer for a foreign person that is trying to sell things into South Africa. Deregistration, you can deregister. Partnerships, guys, please just remember if a partnership le partner leaves, same partnership, same tax number, same VAT number, you don't need to re-register every time a partnership changes. They carry on using the same VAT number itself. And then guys, if you have more than one enterprise, so you've got five enterprises all earning 900,000, they can combine all of them together and penalize you and charge VAT and charge penalties and charge all sorts of stuff if you do something along those lines. Okay, next thing guys, exempt supply zero rated standard. Here's a diagram, you can have a look, okay? What I've got here, guys, is the force of things when something's made for no consideration. So often in exams, items are supplied for no consideration itself. Let's just go through the rules, okay? So I've got you, when a supply is made for no consideration, one should consider whether the supply has been made in the course of or furtherance of an enterprise. So let's just go through this. It says an example of a good supply for no consideration, but still in the course of furtherance of an enterprise is a promotional item given by a rep to a customer to encourage customers to purchase goods in the future. You've heard of Viagra. Well, now we've got the next best thing, but don't take my word for it. Yeah, go take it at home. Okay. You're going to have the best sex of your life. Okay. Promotional item. Okay. It is still given to the doctor in the course and furtherance of an enterprise. So what is your value going to be? I gave it for nothing. So how much VAT is there going to be? Times 15 over 115. Okay, so promotional items. It's section 1023 of the act. You'll see that there's, it's on your tag sheet. Guys, supply for no consideration. It's treated as zero. Donated goods, guys, generally. Okay, general rule when you donate something is you do not donate for business purposes. Um, you normally gen donate with, without business purposes. If you donate, guys, outside of business purposes, it's a change in use. I bought the goods because I was going to sell it. I've now donated it to the public benefit organization. Change in use. There's no business intent there. So we're going to have that, okay, on the donation. So normally for donations, if it's not for business purposes, change in use, and there's going to be that. Okay, when a good is taken within a business is taken up by the owner for his own personal use, guys. I bought, I run a pharmacy. I've got a hot date tonight. I go and I take a box of condoms off the shelf. Okay, I bought it for business purposes to sell inside my pharmacy. But I've got a hot date tonight. So I'm going to take the box of condoms for myself. I've changed from a business purpose to her private purpose, there's going to be a change in use. There'll be that when I take it for free for myself. Okay. Because if the box of condoms gets opened, it's not going back on the shelf. And then guys, a good given to an employee for no consideration will be a fringe benefit and attract that and the supply to the employee. So it depends on how it's valued for fringe benefits purposes as to how you're going to account for that in it. But there will possibly be a change in use there or a VAT implication on that as well. So I just wanted to go for item supplied for no consideration because most of the time people are comfortable with exempt, zero rated and standard, but they don't know what to do if something gets given for free. And then guys, things that are not in the course or furtherance of an enterprise, these are items that never have that. What are they? Salaries are not an enterprise, so no VAT. If you do a hobby, not an enterprise. An exempt supply is not an enterprise, guys. So if I rent out my house for residential accommodation, 
residential accommodation is exempt. It's not in the furtherance of an enterprise. Okay, so please just understand that. Now, let me just explain what this is for. I've got a VAT dash sheet and an approach. So what I've done over time is the most common transactions that are zero rated or exempt from an exam perspective, okay? Within the SACA syllabus, I've put all of them onto a dash sheet, okay? And these are all of the items that are on the dash sheet itself. And what's gonna happen guys? These items in an exam, you normally put a zero down next to. Now they don't give you a mark for the zero. You need to explain to them why it is a zero. So it's very important that you understand the reason it's a zero. So certain veterinary medicine, zero rated. Sanitary towels and pads, zero rated. Whole wheat or brown bread or maize meal, zero rated. Unprocessed fruits and vegetables, zero rated. Cake wheat flour, zero rated. Maize meal, all of those, okay? Not olive oil and not popcorn. Why? Maybe those are, haven't, are eaten by the rich. But olive oil and popcorn, not, but the rest are zero rated. Fuel, zero rated. Exports, zero rated. Certain indirect exports, I will discuss when I do the diagram on exports with you. Supply an SA company on behalf of a non-VAT registered foreigner. So foreign company needs to do something in South Africa. They contact a local person to do their responsibility. You will not charge VAT. It is zero rated, okay? Because you're doing it on behalf of the foreign company. They're not registered for VAT in South Africa. So you zero rate the transaction. Sales rendered outside South Africa to an overseas company. It's like an exported service. Exported services, zero rated. Going concern, zero rated. Kruger Rands, zero rated. Unwrought gold, zero rated. Okay, so unwrought is in its pure form. Okay, before it's been made into a ring. Rates, guys, zero rated. Sure, people make mistakes with rates so often. Please just remember, rates are zero rated, guys. You can't claim VAT on them. Interest is an exempt financial service. If you give or repay a loan, it's an exempt financial service. It's provision of cash. Purchase or sale of shares, an exempt financial service. Long-term assurance, life insurance, is an exempt financial service. Sale or letting of land outside SA is an exempt supplier. Cryptocurrency purchases an exempt financial service. If you with me for the whole of this course, you will see that I will spend 20 minutes doing cryptocurrency because I think cryptocurrency is a spot for your exam. Okay. There's so many tax things that they're doing with cryptocurrency at the moment. Just know cryptocurrency is exempt. Residential accommodation, exempt. Transport of fair paying passengers by road or rail is exempt. Okay. So any fair paying passenger, it's exempt if, if they travel by road or rail. So I know that all of you are wondering why when that taxi stops in front of you on Louis Berta Avenue, why it takes such a long time before they start going again? I can promise you it's not because they're issuing a VAT invoice, okay? Because taxis, exempt, supply, transport of fair paying passengers by road or rail. Educational services, exempt, okay? Trade union services, exempt. Motor car, input VAT denied. Entertainment, input VAT denied. Club subscriptions, input VAT denied. Okay? Guys, motor car sold. Okay? I couldn't claim inputs on acquisition. I don't charge on output. Salaries and wages, not an enterprise. Fringe benefits, it depends, guys. So I've just listed the fringe benefits that don't have VAT on them. Holiday accommodation is entertainment, so input VAT's denied. Residential accommodation is residential accommodation, therefore it's exempt. Cash allowances, there's no good or service, it's a cash given. Guys, share incentive schemes is for shares, it's a financial service. Loan, trust loan is a loan. That's financial service. Paying of an employee's debt is an interesting one. The invoice is not made out to you. If the invoice is not made out to you, you don't get to claim the VAT. Depreciation is not a supply of goods or services. Just vouchers, guys. So um, let's do Musica as a nostalgic thing. 
even though they're closing down all the musicas. If you bought a musica gift voucher, when you bought the voucher, no VAT, but there is VAT when you use the voucher and exchange it for goods. Okay, so that's there. Now guys, how do you basically approach doing an exam question? Okay, you're going to say, is the amount found on a VAT dash sheet? Okay, if it's found in the VAT dash sheet, you're gonna put a zero down and you're gonna put the reason for it. If it is not on the VAT dash sheet, you're gonna say, is there a supply of goods or services from a vendor? If the answer to that is yes, guys, then there's VAT and remember, Normal rules are for invoice basis, value of supplies, the amounts in the invoice, time of supplies, the earlier payments or invoice. And payments basis is the amount paid is the value of supply, time of supplies when the payment is made. And guys, then there's special rules. Now, everything that I'm doing after this in the notes has got special rules attached onto it. So where it doesn't have special rules, I'm going to do it. So let's just go through the structure again. Is the expense found in the VAT dash sheet? If the answer to that's yes, a zero with a reason. Otherwise, is there a supply of goods or services by vendor? Yes. If there's no special rule, just use the normal basics. If there's a special rule, I'm going to discuss it now. Okay. So first one, financial services, guys. Financial services are exempt. So if you see any of these items inside an exam, interest paid, interest received, exchange currency, checks, issuing transfer payments of a loan, debentures, shares, debt securities, unit trusts, life insurance, endowment policies, funeral policies, pension provenance or RAFs, buying or selling a derivative or granting an option, all of these are not included in the definition of financial services. Okay, what's specifically excluded, guys, is the bank charge. If they charge you a bank charge of 115 Rand, obviously there's a service there and you'll have that on it. So you guys can go through that. Next one, new and secondhand goods. So guys, okay, if it's new and secondhand goods, the first question you need to ask yourself is, have the goods been purchased from a VAT vendor? or have the be goods been purchased from a non-vendor? Now guys, if they've been purchased from a VAT vendor, there's always an invoice, and you're always gonna claim VAT off the invoice itself, if that makes sense. So it doesn't make any difference whether it's a new good or a secondhand good, you can claim VAT on it. And then no special rules for it. So what are you going to do? You're gonna say, time of supply earlier of, invoice or payment, value of supply, the amount on the invoice. No problem with that if they purchase from a VAT vendor. Now, if you purchase something from a non-vendor over here in this diagram, there is no invoice that is a valid VAT invoice there. So if it is a new good, guys, tough shit. You can't claim any VAT because you don't have a VAT invoice. But if you buy a secondhand good from a non-vendor, you can claim notional input VAT. How do you do it? on the lower of cost or open market value. And when, time of supply is when you physically pay for the goods itself. You cannot claim it until you've paid for it. There's some extra rules for fixed property, which I'll do with you just now. And again, I'm not asking you to remember all of the shit off by heart. You'll see inside here, I've got, there's the definition of a secondhand good. There's what you can claim for input VAT on secondhand goods. There's the notional input VAT section. And there's the timing for secondhand goods, where it says secondhand goods to the extent of payment. And if I was gonna tag a book, I would use the same color tag and I would put all three of these tags on top of one another so you can find them. And I would look for the three same color tags that are on top of one another and say, in section one, definition of a secondhand good is something that's been previously used excluding. So guys, if they give you a zebra or a hippo or whatever, just remember livestock is not included and certain gold products are not included in there as well. They're not secondhand goods. And how much can I claim? Section one, definition of input VAT paragraph B defines the amounts I can claim. And when can I claim it? To the extent of payment, there it is, 16.1. 
16.3A2 double A. Okay, sounds like a breast size. Not a, no, I'm joking. But yeah, if you guys understand, you can just tag all of the stuff there. So it's a long evening. I have to try to do some humor. Okay, next one, guys. Let's go back here. Okay, I'm not going through everything in the sheets themselves. Okay, so there's the VATs. There, financial services, secondhand goods. Okay. Memberships and subscriptions, guys. Professional subscriptions. Okay, you can claim that on. So if I pay my soccer membership fees, I get to claim. If I pay law society fees, I get to claim. Okay. If I'm a member of the South African Institute of Tax Professionals, I get to claim. Tax practitioner, sorry. Guys, that's on. Other subscriptions that are not professional, input that is denied. So, golf club, dirty tinder, a running club, wanderers club, virgin active membership, all of those, okay? Input that denied on memberships and subscriptions. Next one, entertainment. So, guys, what's the rule with entertainment? Basically, provision of any food, beverages, etc. Guys, the one that's very common in exams is canteens. So, you don't know whether canteen is subsidized or not. If it is subsidized, it is entertainment because then you're giving food cheaper to your staff. So the moment you get a canteen, it's not automatic that a canteen is entertainment. A canteen is only entertainment when the food is subsidized because then it's entertainment. So I'm giving something to my employees cheaper. Okay, so canteens, if they're subsidized, are entertainment itself. There's a list of things there, guys. The exceptions to the rules, okay? There's a whole lot of exceptions over here. I'm just going to run through them quickly. So, guys, if you're in the entertainment business, you run a restaurant, guys, yes, it is your business to provide entertainment. You will claim that and you will charge that, okay? If you in the entertainment business and you supply entertainment to promote your business, there's that. Guys, excess food is given to staff or welfare organizations by restaurant. Guys, if you do do that, you don't need to reverse the VAT on the food. If you give it to a staff or welfare organization, you're allowed to still claim the VAT, even though you give it to a charity. Okay. Guys, whilst you're out of town, the next dot over here, if you're out of town, you can still claim the, the entertainment. Guys, entertainment provided in a transport that is included in an all-inclusive ticket. When you fly SAA or when you used to fly SAA, there was a meal included. Guys, because the air ticket said air ticket and it didn't list the meal separately, you can claim input VAT on the meal because it was part of a that invoice itself. So you any entertainment provided with transport that's an all-inclusive ticket where the meal's not separately listed on the ticket, you can claim input VAT on that. Seminar organizers, input VAT. Welfare organization gives out food, you can claim. Food provided by ship operator to passengers, you can claim the input VAT. Entertainment provided to clients as prizes by betting establishments, I need to get the guy pissed because he's going to lose more money when he's drunk. You can claim input VAT on that as well. So those are the exceptions there. Motor cars, you need to decide whether something's a motor car or not a motor car. I need you to understand if it's a motor car, input VAT is denied. However, this is what is relevant, guys. It is not what you use a motor vehicle for that is important. What is important is what it looks like. So is the passenger space bigger than the load space or not? So if you want to measure, are the seats bigger than the boot or are the, is the boot bigger than the seats? If the boot is bigger than the seats, then it's not a motor car and you can claim that. If the seats are bigger than the boot, then it's a motor car as defined. You can't claim input VAT on a motor car. Okay, so that's there. Guys, if you've got 17 seats or more, even though it's all passenger space, you're not a motor car. So you can claim on a vehicle with 17 seats or more. 
you can claim as not a motor car. Guys, it's not how many people fit into that taxi. It is how many seats there are in that taxi. I don't care whether you can fit 27 people into that 12-seater. It's how many seats there are from a VAT perspective. It's got nothing to do with what you use the vehicle for. Okay? Game viewing vehicles and hearses I'll discuss now and motor car dealers. Just remember, for a motor car dealer, a motor car is not a motor car. It's trading stock. So motor car dealers claim VAT and charge VAT as per normal. It's not a motor car to them. It is trading stock. Just ancillary costs. Guys, please just remember, fuel, zero rated, that's that block. Interest on a loan, exempt. The rest of the stuff, insurance, licensing, okay? Running costs, cleaning the car, servicing the car. All of those, you can claim input VAT on. The input VAT denied is only on buying a car. Okay, not on the services. Next, sale of a vehicle, guys, it depends. Okay, okay, are you registered for VAT or not? If you are registered for VAT, you need to ask yourself, did I claim input VAT when I bought the car? If I did not claim input VAT when I bought it, I do not need to charge VAT when I sell it. Okay. So that's basically what's going to happen if that's the middle block. If input VAT was claimed, then I need to charge VAT. Okay. And then, guys, I know this sounds really, really strange, but I have seen it before. If you bought anything under the sales tax regime, that's 1989 and before. Guys, even if you did not claim VAT when you bought it, you still need to charge VAT now. So, I mean, it is conceivable that you bought your office building that you trade out of in 1985 with sales tax and now you sell it this year you will charge VAT on it even though you didn't claim VAT when you bought it anything that was bought before VAT came into play you need to charge output VAT when you sell it okay conversion of a vehicle guys so from a motor car to a non-motor car so I'm um, converting I buy a Toyota um, and oh, let me do a city golf. I bought a city golf. It's a motor car. I then take out the two back seats in the car and I make it into a load box. I'm converting it to a non motor car. So when I buy the city golf, input that or not. When I take out the two back seats, I'm going to claim input that because it's now not a motor car anymore. It's a, well, it's not a motor car. And then when I sell, I need to charge VAT because it's not a motor car. A vehicle converted from a non-motor car to a motor car, I buy a cab and a half, okay, claim VAT. Converted to a double cab, on the conversion, it's now becoming a motor car. Double cabs are always treated as motor cars in terms of the act. So input VAT denied. When I sell the double cab, I need to charge VAT because I claim VAT when I bought it. It originally is a cab and a half. And then, guys, if I convert the car before use, okay, if I've not used it before, it's what it is afterwards. So if I run a mortuary and I need a hearse, but what I do with a hearse, I take a station wagon and I convert it into a hearse, okay? What's going to happen if I never used it as a station wagon? You wait until you see what it looks like. And a hearse, you can claim that on because it's definitely not for the transport of passengers. It's transport of the coffin and the dead person. So you can claim for a hearse and you can claim for a game viewing vehicle. Okay. You can claim. So you can claim for that. Guys. Purses and game viewing vehicles, please just make sure that you read through it. Guys, inside the tagging, I've got a definition of what a game viewing vehicle is. So if you tag properly, you can just check to see whether it's a game viewing vehicle. You can claim on hearses. You can claim on game viewing vehicles. Okay. Sundry other vehicle considerations. If a car is acquired as a prize. You can only claim input VAT when you give the prize, and then there's going to be an output VAT when the prize is given. 
So at Monte Casino, if there's a car there for six months on the floor, you can't claim that until you give it out as a prize. And then there'll be an input and an output in the same period. Transport of fare paying passengers by road or rail. Guys, it's an exempt supply. I buy a 50 seater bus. Normally, if a bus has got 17 or more seats, I can claim that. But I can't claim the VAT on a 50 seater bus if I'm using it for an exempt supply. Vehicle acquired for entertainment. Entertainment is input VAT denied. So, an example of this might be a caravan. Okay. I do it because I'm going to use it for entertainment and go away on holiday. Can't claim. And hiring of motor cars, please just remember, if you hire a motor car, input VAT is denied. Okay. Output VAT on disposal of goods. You guys can just have a look at it. Just remember, guys, people tend to have this belief that if I didn't claim VAT when I bought it, I don't have to charge VAT when I sell it. And that is wrong. The only two times that you don't need to charge VAT on sale is if it is an exempt supply. Okay, so I bought a bed for my residential accommodation. I then sell the bed. I didn't claim VAT. When I bought the bed, it was exempt. I don't need to charge VAT. When I sell the bed, it was exempt. And the other time I don't need to charge VAT is if there is a input VAT or not. I bought the car. I couldn't claim VAT when I bought the car. When I sell the car, I don't need to charge VAT. But I'll give you an example. I bought a new car from a non-vendor. I can't claim VAT when I buy a new car from a non-vendor. But I will still have to charge VAT when I sell the car because there wasn't input VAT denied and there wasn't an exempt supply. Therefore, got to charge VAT. So it's only for exempt supplies and when input VAT is denied that I don't need to charge VAT. And that's what's on this diagram. Deemed outputs on the change of accounting basis. If I go from payments to invoice, there's rules for it. If you want to do it, you guys can do it by yourselves. I'm just doing it from completeness sake. Importation of goods now. So let's have a look at importation of goods. Okay. So I'm going to explain how this works to you. So it says here, consider a person standing on the border of Botswana and South Africa. You want a chocolate bar. It costs 10 Rand in Botswana and 10 Rand plus 1 Rand 50 VAT in South Africa. People would buy from Botswana because it's cheaper. So how does VAT legislation work? If you're going to bring it across the border, you need to pay the 1 Rand 50 output VAT to SARS. Okay. And I know this sounds really, really strange. I'm buying and I need to pay output. Okay. To SARS. Guys, normally I claim an input when I buy something and SARS would give me an input credit. The thing is, guys, if you buy something overseas, bring it across the border, they collect VAT at the border post. Okay. If you import it from a BSLN country, output VAT is charged at 15% of customs duty value. And it's when the goods are released from customs. If you're buying it from a non-BSLN country, that stands for Botswana, Swaziland, Lesotho, and Namibia. It's customs duty value plus 10% of customs duty value plus non-rebated customs duty plus other import surcharges. And why do I times by 15% and not 15 over 115? Because the amount when it comes across the border is not that inclusive. It's excluding SA VAT. And what do we do when something's excluding VAT? We need to times by 15%. When something is including VAT, we times by 15 over 115. Okay, so please just remember that. Just there's special rules with bonded warehouses. You can leave stuff in bonded warehouses and you only pay the VAT when you take it out the bonded warehouse. So there's like you can import it. I don't need all of it now. Put it into a bonded warehouse. You don't need to pay the input VAT now. You only need to pay the input VAT when you take it out the bonded warehouse. And there's a rule there with the block. Imported services are a strange thing. So let me just explain. Like when the World Cup was in South Africa, I actually did a little bit of work for Mnet. Okay. And we had a really, really strange thing because 
Mnet did the recording and did all the camera work for the World Cup. It then got given to an overseas supplier because they had the rights to the World Cup. It then got beamed to a satellite and then Mnet bought the soccer games back from the overseas supplier. Now, that is what an imported service might be. It's something that you import, but basically it doesn't need to go through a customs thing. So the best way that I can do it is, like if you download music or you download a movie or Mnet downloads a movie and shows it on their channels or downloads a soccer match and shows it on their channels. Now, let me just explain what's going to happen. Okay? So in practice, if they were buying it from an SA vendor, and let's imagine they were paying 115,000 Rand. Mnet, that account, if they're buying it from a South African, what would happen is they would claim 50, they would pay 15,000 Rand that across to the supplier and claim 15,000 Rand inputs and there'd be no VAT effect. They pay outputs, claim inputs, no VAT effect, sorry. So what that basically says, when we import a service, okay, if there's no VAT effect, okay, don't worry about it. So if Mnet got the World Cup back in and they supplied it to people in South Africa, it's don't worry about it. I charge VAT on subscriptions. Therefore, I would claim VAT on the TV transmission. Therefore, don't worry about it. But let's imagine you're visiting an Mnet service center and they've got music playing, which is equal to entertainment. And what did they do? They downloaded it from Apple Music. Okay. Because it's entertainment, okay? Input that, denied. Okay. So what would happen, guys? Looking at this VAT account, they would pay output VAT, but they wouldn't be able to claim on the music because it's entertainment. So whenever you import a service and input VAT is denied on the service you're importing, like music, you pay output to SARS. And this is quite common in exams. You need to pay output to SARS because SARS wants the 15 grand that you're not claiming because it's entertainment. So if you bought the music from South Africa, SARS would get 15,000 rand. Because you bought it overseas, SARS still wants their 15,000 rand because you weren't going to be able to claim the input VAT. That's why on imported services, if you were going to claim input VAT, you don't need to do anything. There's no VAT effect. If, you, if it was an exempt supply that you were importing, you have to pay the VAT across to SARS. So that's there, imported services. And that's over there. I'm going to do exports, and then I'm going to give you a break. Okay. Diagram 15.1, exports of goods. Direct exports, guys, you can zero rate. That's when I take it outside the country. I can do it. If I'm responsible, I've got all the documentation I can claim. Now, how it works, guys, is that if I get a third-party contractor to take it overseas for me, okay, I need to get all of the documentation back. If I do not get the documentation back within 90 days, I need to charge VAT. If I eventually do get the documentation back, then I can claim the VAT back. Okay? So I can get a third party to take it overseas. I need the documentation. The moment I've got the documentation, I can zero rate a transaction. Okay. An indirect export. So let me just explain. You run a jewelry shop in Sandton City. A foreigner walks in and says, I just have to have that diamond necklace please. And then you 
take her to the terminal. She says, don't charge me that. I'm a foreigner. I'm going to leave on a plane tonight. I'm going overseas. And you say this. I do not know whether you're going to take it out of this country. Therefore, I'm going to charge you VAT. And there's VAT reclamation at the airport. And you can go get the VAT back at the airport. Keep the invoice. Keep the necklace. Go show them that you've taken it overseas, that you're on an international flight. Okay? Go claim everything back, and you can do that. So on an indirect export, if someone else is taking it overseas, you charge the VAT. They must get it back from customs when it goes across the border. Okay. And then exports of secondhand goods acquired from non-vendors. I'm just going to show you a practical example that I saw in practice. So funny enough, someone found uh, a 1968 Ford, I think it was a Thunderbird in South Africa. There were only two right-hand drives ever made by the way. Um, and one went to Australia and it got destroyed. The other one came to South Africa and a collector found it. He basically offered the guy 5,000 Rand for it. Okay. And what was going to, what happened? Because it's a secondhand good. He claimed input of 5,000 Rand times 15 over 115. It's a secondhand good. What he then did was he exported it to Australia for 8 million rand, believe it or not. Okay, so here's the thing. Exports are zero rated. So what SARS does is it says, if you claimed notional input VAT when you buy something, so step one, I claim notional input VAT. Okay, if I then export it, I'm going to zero rate the sale. And what happens is the section says you need to give SARS back the notional input claimed. So even though he sold it for 8 million, he had needed to give back to SARS 5,000 Rand times 15 over 115. Okay. So whenever you export a secondhand good acquired from a non-vendor, whatever any notional input that, that you claim, you've got to give back to SARS when you export it. And that's what's going to happen. Exports of services, guys, you can zero rate them. It depends on where the service is being rendered, though. So I've got you, a non-resident orders a tour from an SA tour operator to climb Kilimanjaro. Zero rated. Services taking place overseas. But if you order a tour from an SA tour operator and it's a tour of the Cape Wine farms, you can't zero rate it because you're giving them the tour inside South Africa. So you've got to charge that on it. So you need to understand, okay, where the service is being rendered. If a service is being rendered overseas, zero rated. Also, guys, if you bring something into South Africa to fix, you can zero rated if you're certain that the good is going to be taken back across the border after you fix it as well. I've got that. It's in this block over here. If the goods is repaired in South Africa. And then if an SA resident goes overseas and renders services in a foreign country, the bill for charging those services worse would be zero rated. So if Robert Mugabe needed a brain operation and you were the doctor that went and performed it, and you performed it in Zimbabwe, you would zero rate your services. You weren't doing your professional service in South Africa. Okay. Believe it or not, there is cases you need to know for the board exam. There are cases that I've got there. This case you need to know. It's a Stellenbosch Farmers Winery case. Essentially, there was an early termination of a distribution right, and they surrendered their rights. Okay, and it was for Bell's Whiskey, and the location of a distribution right comes from Scotland, and therefore you could zero rate it, but you can have a look at the case over here. Okay, this is, this is just showing you with that how this works. So I would know the court case itself. That is a court case you need to know. Okay, so 
accommodation and rental guys what's happening with this if it's residential accommodation residential accommodation is exempt from that so there's no that it's exempt from that commercial accommodation it depends whether it's office or factory could be a hotel okay so there's different rules for hotels as compared to or office rent or factory rent so general rule for commercial accommodation office factory rent charged at 15 percent for hotels for the room it depends on how long you stay inside the room itself so if you stay greater than 28 days that is at 60 percent times 15 percent if you stay less than or equal to 28 days that is at 15 percent other services could be meals could be telephone that's at 15 percent okay but if you tell them you're going to be staying for greater than 28 days from the beginning from day one they will charge you at 60 percent times by the 15 percent itself the other thing is you need to actually just understand the concept of um, what the bill looks like so at a hotel you could have one of two things they could sit there and say this is the room and the room is 500 rand for the day and then meals are 300 okay so that would be at 60 percent maybe whereas this one will be at 100 percent okay but if they decide to do the bill like this and they say that it's room but room includes meals and it's 800 rand you can have that at 60 percent of everything so it depends on what's actually on the invoice itself so if it's an all-inclusive rate just for the room with everything else everything can be at 60 percent even though meals are included in there it's like the plane ticket that are <laughs> that i discussed a little bit earlier depends what's on the invoice itself as to what you're going to charge and what you're going to claim next one there's commercial accommodation 28 days or 29 days i've got the discussion of an all-inclusive fee on the next page so you guys can have a look at it inside that block inside this block there's another thing guys just with bad debts that get written off remember if we charge that at 60 percent the bad debt is also going to be done at 60 percent as well so sometimes people forget about that okay you could find something like that within a question and then it says okay just remember for voluntary registrations guys that it's 120 for commercial residential establishment not 50,000 but that I did with registration a little bit earlier as well purchase and sale of fixed property let me just go through it with you if you're a property dealer there's always that because that's your trading stock and there's always going to be that on it whether it's residential or commercial okay it's all there um, often you see like in newspapers with advertising they say no vat save thousands actually they've been quite disingenuous with that it's like saying why don't you so so no sorry um sorry with a, a a developer they say no transfer duty save thousands what they're basically saying to you is why don't you pay vat at 15 percent rather than transfer du transfer duty at a much much lower rate you're actually paying more with the vat being added onto it but you don't have transfer duty if you pay vat itself so you can save transfer duty if it's a purchase from a dealer now if you're not a question property dealer the question too is is this a commercial or residential property so property dealer always that whether it's residential or commercial if you're not a property dealer if it's residential prop property no that is transfer duty if it's bought from a if it's commercial property it depends are you buying from a vendor or a non-vendor if you buy from a vendor guys what is the rule for property that is levied on a payments basis and value of supplies equal to the amount paid times 15 over 115 and the time of supplies the earlier of payments or registration in the deeds office so in a question you need to be very very particular about what's happening you pay the deposit can claim the vat on the deposit if it's non-refundable if it's a refundable deposit and you can still get out of the cell obviously there's no vat because you it still might be refunded to you okay 
Once the property is transferred into your name and you register a mortgage bond, you can claim for everything. And time is applies on the earlier of payments or registration in the deeds office. It's when it gets registered in the deeds office. If you buy from a non-vendor, if it's a new building, you can't claim notional input VAT on a new asset. We've done that in secondhand goods before. If you buy a secondhand building, guys, there is transfer duty, but you can claim notional input VAT on a secondhand building purchased from a non-vendor, provided it's not residential, it's a commercial building itself. And there are special rules for it. Now, you're never ever going to remember all of the rules when it comes to fixed property. So what you guys need to do is, there are three sections here, timing of rules for fixed property. You need to clearly demarcate in your book, section 93D, timing rules for fixed property. And it says fixed property where registration is done in the deeds registry on the dates of such registration and on the date which payment is made, whichever date is earlier. You don't need to remember it. And then it says there's an additional timing rule for secondhand fixed property. It's, there's the section numbers. Subject to the provision of BB to the extent of payment for consideration and registration in the deeds registry. So if you buy a secondhand building from a non-vendor, it's not just that, but you add that onto it. And remember, rates and taxes are zero rated with it. And for all of these sections, there's the sections for imports of goods. There's sections for exports of goods. Every single diagram I've done with you, that's what the blue line is for. Blue line basically shows you the sections where they come from and what you need to highlight in your book. Section number, what you should put on your tag and where the section in the act is. Okay, so let's carry on. Okay, please remember, you don't need to remember all of this. Insurance and assurance, guys. Again, you don't need to remember. There's section 8.8 here. It's for insurance payments. And what does it say? For a contract of insurance deemed to be consideration received on the date of receipt of the payment provided... It does not apply to payment relates to total reinstatement of goods. This is what you would highlight inside your book. So just going through that again, what can you do? If it's a payment, life insurance is exempt. Remember, assurance, life policy, dread disease, disability, all exempt. So in endowment policies are all exempt. Financial services, short-term insurance, you can claim that input. If it's a claim, guys, if it's a claim for life insurance, dread disease, or disability, exempt. Exempt when we paid it, exempt when we receive it. If an insurance company pays out for short-term insurance, what happens? We should ask, is it an other asset or motor car entertainment? Remember, if it's motor car entertainment, no VAT claimed on acquisition, no VAT on the insurance payout. For other assets, there is a deemed supply value. That is the amount paid out. And time of supply is when the insurance company agrees to pay it out. Now, guys, if there's reinstatement of goods, what's going to happen with reinstatement of goods? There is no VAT for reinstatement of goods. Okay. Can you see here it says insurance company replaces the asset? No VAT implications, enterprises in the same position as before. And all of that stuff, just again, you don't need to remember it. There it is, Section 8 Act. You put the tag in, you go through it, you can know where to find everything. Let's carry on. Next one, rentals, installment credit agreements. So just let me explain. If you've got an installment credit or a finance lease, it's got one set of rules. Anything that's not an installment credit agreement is a rental agreement as defined. So what's basically going to happen, guys, is this. If it's an installment credit agreement, finance, lease, high purchase, expensive sell. If it's a motor car entertainment asset, input VAT is denied. Anything else, value of supplies, open market value times 15 over 114. Now, why would that be open market value? Because a lease agreement doesn't have a selling price in it. So you can see, section 10.6, cash value of that supply. 
That's what section 10.6 does. So open market value of the supply. And what does section 9.3c do for insurance agreements? Time the goods are delivered or the time the payments of consideration, whichever time is earlier. So again, it's not a process where you need to learn all of the stuff of there's your time of supply rule. You can do it whenever you like, but you claim the asset upfront for this. It's like you buying it with an installment credit agreement or a finance lease. If it's a rental agreement, an operating lease, you claim VAT on each payment, okay? But if it's motor car entertainment, remember, input VAT is denied. Guys, repossession of goods, guys. Please just be careful. It's not what the goods are worth. It's what the debtor is recorded at in your records, okay? When you work out repossession of goods. Because you're going to be reversing out the debtor and getting an asset back. It's based on what the value of the debt is, not what the value of the asset is. But you can have a look with repossession of goods. It's on 19.2. Creditors not paid within 12 months. If you don't pay a creditor within 12 months, in month 13, you're required to reverse the VAT out and pay the VAT back to SARS. Bad debts, guys. Depends what the bad debt is for. If you charge VAT on the data on the debt when it was created there's going to be a vat input when you write off the bad debt if it's on an export data it was zero rated therefore there's no vat on the write off of the debt because it was zero rated if it's a staff loan staff loans are exempt remember no vat on exempt items if it's a staff loan because you bought stock, obviously it would fall under that section over there. And you would have charged that when you sold the stock to the person. That's not a staff loan. That's a, from a sale within South Africa. Interest charge on overdue accounts. If you write off that as a bad debt, just remember interest is an exempt supply. Therefore, there's no VAT when you write off interest. Okay. Just with commercial accommodation, just please just remember that 60% rule. If you've charged VAT at 60%, then you need to write off VAT at 60% for bad debts as well. Discounts, guys. Just one or two just concepts. A trade discount is a discount you get if you buy something. So trade discounts, they've got no VAT effect. So it says, consider a good normally sold for 11,500 that's sold for cash of 69 after applying a trade discount of 4.6, no discounts in the journal entry because there's nothing that needs to happen with that discount. Settlement discounts, if you pay within 10 days, you will get a discount, okay? Because there's an actual transaction there, I have decided to pay within 10 days, there will be VAT on settlement discounts. So this example actually shows you how to deal with a settlement discount. Fringe benefits, guys, if you give an asset to an employee, a service to an employee, or a company car to an employee, there's a fringe benefit. It's a deemed supply. Please just remember when you're doing fringe benefits, it's classified as a deemed supply in terms of the act. And again, if you go into your section here, there it is for fringe benefit, section 18.3. Benefit advantage to an employee shall not apply to exempt supplies, zero rated or entertainment. So those are all the items that are going to be there. And then 9.7, it says, shall be deemed to take place at the end of the month that it gets included in remuneration itself. There's a deemed supply there for fringe benefits themselves. Guys, what doesn't have? Cash allowances, loan just loans, housing subsidies. I've already gone through all of these as to why they do not have any VAT on them. So all of these get excluded out. The only ones that we've got, VAT on fringe benefits, is when you give an asset to an employee, give a service to an employee, or give a company car to an employee. Now, here's a really, really interesting thing. There's an example here, and I just want to just go through it and just show you. If I buy trading stock for 11,500 rand, here's my journal entry, debit trading stock 10,000, Debit input VAT, 1500. Credit, okay, bank, 11.5. Now, imagine I was to give the stock out to an employee as a fringe benefit. What would you base it on? 
whenever you give something to an employee as a fringe benefit trading stock, it goes out at cost. How much is your VAT on that item? Sorry, this gets asked quite often. So if you give the stock out to an employee as a fringe benefit, guys, what's going to happen is you're going to credit your trading stock, 10,000. Okay. You're going to debit salaries with an amount, and you're going to credit output that because we're giving that to an employee. I would like you to think about what you would put into the output that's over there. The output VAT is actually 10,000 Rand, because that's the value of the stock, times by 15 divided by 115. 1304. And what will your salary's expense be? It'll be 11,304. I know that you think that the 1500 and the 1304 need to be the same, but they do not need to be the same. Please be careful. This is something that gets asked quite often within an exam environment. Just because there's something with an input doesn't mean it's with an output. Okay. And how do you value the fringe benefit for tax purposes for that? It's basically based on what you value it in your individual tax calc itself. It's valued at 10 in the individual tax calc. That's why there's 1,304 Rand for that. Overpayments, guys. Basic rule, if it's not repaid within four months, you have to charge output. If you then repay it after the four month period, then you can claim the input back. So someone overpays you, nothing. Four months later, if you haven't given it back to them, output that and then input that. Transport of passengers and goods, depends on what you're actually looking at. Transport of fair paying passengers by road or rail, Okay, we've already done, where is it there? Sorry, exempt. From inside SA, outside SA, zero rated. So international transport, zero rated. From overseas to South Africa, zero rated. It's international transport. Fair paying passengers from a location outside SA to a location inside SA, zero rated. Okay, international transport, zero rated. The transport of fair paying passengers from a location inside SA to a location inside SA is zero rated if it was part of an international trip. So if I'm going to the UK and I fly from Durban to Joburg and then I change planes and I go from Joburg to the UK, that's part of an international trip. The local flight will be zero rated because it's part of an international trip. Transport of goods within South Africa, vatable. It's there. Transport of goods when you export them are zero rated. And then the transport of fair paying passengers by air between destinations within South Africa is vatable. Joburg to Cape Town, vat. Joburg to Durban, vat. Durban to George, vat. Okay, so all of that gets included. Just some sundry rules quickly. Betting supplies, it's only when they get paid is there. That's on betting supplies. Door-to-door -door sales, because in South Africa, you can cancel door-to-door -door sales within five days. That is only recorded on the sixth day when they know that you haven't canceled the sale. Single supply treated as a multiple supply. Okay. So guys, I need you to just understand. Okay. So you work at an audit firm and the audit firm builds the client. What do they build the client? They build the client for services, X amount. They bill for travel because you have to travel to the client for another amount. And maybe they're billing for meals, which is another account because you had to do a whole lot of overtime itself. Please just understand that there is only a single supply there. Because what are you providing to them? You're not providing travel to them. You're not providing meals to them. You're providing an audit. So all of that stuff will get combined together and there'll be VAT on the whole bill that's an audit fee. You can't sit there and say, oh, look, this is meals, therefore it's entertainment, which is exempt. And look, there's travel and it's fair paying passengers. You can't do anything along those lines itself. That single supply is for auditing. 
and you will claim for VATs on everything. And then so there's a couple of administrative things here. You guys can read through it. Okay. Everything is over here. I'm not going to go through this. <clears throat> 